In casinos across the globe, gamblers bet their bank accounts on games of chance. Players thrill with each spin of the wheel and every roll of the dice. But for some, beating the house isn't fun in games. It's business. Every day, cheats, con men, and card sharks take millions from the gaming floors. And here I beat this place, right here, for four or five thousand. The one next door to it, I beat for four or five thousand. Casinos retaliate by going high tech. It's a continuous cat and mouse game. They're gonna do one thing to us, we have to now build our machines differently to stop them. Welcome. Casting surveillance nets to catch the thieves. Excuse me, some security, I'm gonna need you to gather your chips and come with me. A war is being waged 24-7 on these neon-drenched battlefields. And with billions of dollars at stake, every skirmish has its winners and losers. The Las Vegas Strip, its attraction is undeniable. Millions check into this shiny world to gamble, see a show, have some fun. Across the country, players contribute over $30 billion of their hard-earned money to casinos annually. The vast majority of these gamblers come prepared to win or lose on the level. But the cheats have a different approach. They steal. And for casino professionals like Jim Hartley, it's hard telling the two apart. Everyone and anyone can be a suspect. Everyone's gonna cheat. And I gotta be honest, that's the way I look at something, is everybody lies, everybody cheats, everybody steals. You can cheat at blackjack, at the craps table, at roulette. But it turns out nothing's more vulnerable to a cheating heart than a slot machine. Up to 80% of a casino's revenue comes from its slots. Their appeal to gamblers is clear. Slot machines are colorful, easy to play, and require absolutely no skill. But cheating the slots requires talent. The difference between me and the gambler who gets a thrill from just gambling, I don't gamble. I cheat. That's what I do. Former slot cheat Mr. D is a wanted man, facing 26 criminal charges for cheating in Nevada. He's granted us permission to film his interview at this undisclosed location in Vegas. What I find attractive about cheating slots is I'm anonymous. I'd walk up to a machine, not a person. Mr. D started out as a card shark. But when a friend showed him a simple device called a light wand, he decided it was time for a career change and found he could make a living alone and in the shadows. I would go off somewhere in a corner that wasn't under a, a lot of surveillance because, uh, frankly, it held the same amount of money whether it was in the middle of the, of the floor or if it was off in a corner. The light wand was like a killer app for cheating the slots. It was easy to make. A couple of batteries wired to a small pin light. All Mr. D had to do was put it in the coin tray and point the light into the payout chute. Casino consultant Jason England describes how this little device helped Mr. D beat the machine and clean it out. It was switched on and it blinded the electro-optical reader that was counting the coins as the coin rolled past this particular device. With the light up inside, the machine was blinded and it could not tell how many coins were coming out. Mr. D could have emptied any machine on one winning play, a payout of up to $500. Instead, he won $100 here, $200 there, nothing to draw attention. to be successful at this, you have to be content to rank with the common herd. You can't let everybody know that what you can do. Otherwise, you'll get arrested, right? So you have to be, you have to keep a low profile. 
You can make $1,000 a day and wouldn't have to deal with anybody. Mr. D knew someone might be watching, but didn't let it face him. If you look around and look for ghosts, you'll see ghosts. And you won't do it. You'll, you'll talk yourself out of it. So you just have to put your head down, have confidence in it, and do it. The light wand was one of the most successful devices in the history of slot machine cheating. It was probably the device that took more money out of the industry than any other. And while we're not exactly sure how much money was stolen during the light wand era, estimates run into the high hundreds of millions of dollars. Mr. D estimates he cheated casinos out of nearly $1 million over 10 years using the light wand. And he didn't lose much sleep over it. The casinos that I beat, I didn't look at beating that casino. There wasn't a face there in front of me. You know, I looked at it like I'm beating a machine. To protect their profits from grifters and con men like Mr. D, casinos are spending millions on surveillance technology. At the newly opened Aria Resort and Casino in Las Vegas, spying on cheaters has been taken to the next level. Director of Surveillance Ted Whiting is allowing television cameras inside his command post for the first time. From this vantage point, Ted and his staff can monitor the action on the gaming floor from any of over 1,000 cameras. Everything that goes on inside the casino, table game, slots, poker, cage, racing sports, etc., that is the domain of this department here. Well, the role of a surveillance director and everyone who works in surveillance is to protect the casino's assets. Those assets are considerable. A good night for the Aria means a take of up to $10 million. There's 150,000 square feet of gaming floor to monitor and the potential for cheating at every table and every slot. Obviously, we can't monitor all 1,100 cameras at the same time. So what we do is we pick cameras that are of interest at that moment. And interest could be a phone call from the pit that says, hey, we've got a guy betting a lot of money. That's somebody who we would watch. And some things that we look for are things that are out of place. So maybe somebody walking too quickly. That would be a person of interest. The Aria gaming floor never closes, so the surveillance staff rotates on a 24-hour schedule. The operators remotely control video feeds, and select feeds are recorded digitally. When we see someone who we suspect is cheating and we have the video to prove it, that's when we call security. And of course, we inform the appropriate law enforcement agency. They make the determination whether or not an arrest should be made based on our video coverage. Eddie Collier engineered the digital system that stores the daily video record. It's very critical that all this equipment is running 24-7. If, if one part of it is down at any, any time, it's definitely compromising our business. So we need to make sure that this is running 100% all the time. If even one camera fails to operate, a six-figure theft can go unseen. How would you like to handle that one? OK, so we've got two fixed and one PTZ, is that right? So security starts with daily camera maintenance. Today, Eddie and Ted direct a technician to reposition a PTZ, or pan-tilt zoom camera. Let's tighten it up, and I think we're good. The adjusted angle will give surveillance operators a bigger and better look at the honest gamblers and the cheats. We don't hate it when people win. This is casino people are supposed to have fun. Copy, thank you. Some people win, it's okay. But that's where I come in. That's when I have to analyze the play and make sure that, that, that it wasn't an advantage or a cheat. If somebody beats us, it's fine. As long as we know why they beat us and, and that it was a clean win. Thanks for us. Excellent job. But even with hundreds of cameras trained on the gaming floor, some cheating scams go unnoticed. And casinos have lost tens of thousands with one roll of the dice. One of the most popular table games at the casino is craps. It's a favorite of high rollers who like the odds on the winning combinations. 
An opening roll of seven can pay out up to four to one. Betting on a roll of two or 12 can pay a whopping 30 to one. A hot hand with the dice and big bets can mean thousands of dollars to a lucky gambler. The craps table was the scene of one infamous scam that beat the house for thousands on one roll of the dice. Four cheats worked as a team to pull this con off. The scammer's tools, a magnet hidden in a wheelchair, and juiced dice. Juiced dice are a regular set of dice where the spots are drilled a little deeper and a metallic alloy is implanted into the die. Salva hitman Piacente advises casinos on how to spot a cheat at the craps table. Big winning bets on long odds could indicate juiced dice are in play. With juiced dice, you want to win the most amount of money in the shortest amount of time. On a crap game, you want the biggest payout, which happens to be 30 to 1 on both box cars, which is two sixes, and snake eyes, which is two aces. The original juice dice scam involved four players and the coordination of a military operation. There was the shooter, also known as the dice mechanic. The mechanic's role is to switch the dice in and out of the game. He's gonna put the crooked dice into the game and then take them back out when the play is over. There were two blockers, a man and a woman, position next to the dealers. Blockers are the most important part of the team because they distract the dealer off the action for that split second. The fourth teammate operated the magnet hidden in the base of his wheelchair. He's the one placing the magnet under the table in order to control the dice and he's the one that flips the switch. Here's how they worked it. 2,000 on aces. One of the blockers makes a big $2,000 bet on snake eyes. The last minute wager diverts the dealer's attention for a split second. That's when the mechanic switches in the juice dice. The dice are thrown. The blockers place late bets to distract the two dealers magnet is switched on when the dice reach the end of the table. The result? Snake eyes and a $60,000 payout. Now all hell will break loose on the table. $60,000! This person just won $60,000. The casino employees are not going to know what hit them. $60,000! The trick in pulling this scam off is everybody working together as one. The switcher has to be very proficient in getting the dice in. The blockers have to be very proficient in distracting everyone. And of course, the person in the wheelchair has to be proficient in his timing and making sure he hits the magnet at the right time. Now all the mechanic has to do is switch back the casino dice before the next roll. The team leaves the table one at a time. And the casino doesn't even know it's been had. Here you go, dealer's money. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Table 11 is security. We have a but pulling a scam like that today would probably have different results. Late bets tip surveillance personnel like Ted Whiting to look harder at the win. Swapping dice happen so fast that there aren't a lot of things you can see. So what you have to look for is what the play looks like. The wheelchair, he's up to something, right? They're going to make their switch quickly. The guy shooting the dice probably isn't going to be the one betting the money. The guy betting the money is his buddy, who they act as if they're not together. You're going to see late bets coming in and arms flying around. That's unusual. So that's when we would get involved. As soon as we see that kind of suspicious move, we run the video back in, in an instant, and we can grab them right away. This is a scam that happened a long time ago and hasn't resurfaced in a while. But you never know when it can come back. Most cheats defeat casinos working simple scams, such as chip pinching and card swapping. 
And the more they succeed, the more confident they get. For some of the really good cheats, I mean, they just come at you. Just come in and start doing it. And there is no setup. They've been doing it for 10, 15, 20 years. It's what they do. It's not something out of the ordinary for them. So when it happens to you, you've got to realize, oh, that's actually, whoa, the guy just did it, you know. And he probably did it before. Driving the strip at night reminds slot cheat Mr. D of the haul he raked in over nearly 30 years of stealing. First thing I think about when I drive the strip at night is how many places I beat. All these places I can look at. I've been in here, I beat this place right here for four or five thousand. The one next door to it, I beat for four or five thousand. And look, there's plenty to go around. It's mine for the taking because look how many spots there are. You can go in that Denny's right there and they got slot machines. Every spot we go to it has one. The thrill for me on a scale of one to hundred is a hundred. Let me tell you, because you've gotten this money through your own wherewithal, your own wits, and your own courage. And it doesn't get any better than that. In the 1990s, when casinos were built of millions by cheats with light wands, they decided to get rid of coin slots altogether. Ironically, the success of the light wand caused its demise. The man who invented it started selling it to different people for large amounts of money. It just got to be too well known. And then the, consequently, the slot machine makers took steps to uh, stop it. My response to the light wand becoming obsolete was a penny, because that was a, my major way of making a living. And here it was coming to an end. Looking for something cheap proof, slot manufacturers converted the machines to accept folding cash and make payouts on paper. Slot cheats quickly found a weakness in the new machines and came up with a second generation light wand, the Credit Blaster. A Credit Blaster is an electronic device that simulates the signal generated by the bill validators that are mounted on every single slot machine. These Credit Blasters can rack up hundreds of fake dollars on a machine that can then be cashed out as if they were real. The best credit blasters are typically designed to look like an everyday object. For instance, this one is disguised as a simple key fob or garage door opener. Since the bill validator was out in the open, the cheat needed to be hidden from surveillance. So Mr. D decided to bring in a partner. If I was making 1,000 a day, I could just as easily make 2,000 a day if I had someone else. I wanted someone there to block out the video, so if they couldn't see me doing it on video, it, it, even if I did get arrested, I would eventually beat it in court. The first time he used the blaster, Mr. D ripped off $300 worth of false credits in a matter of seconds. I was so happy. I mean, this was the epitome of slot cheating. I could win uh, 10 times more money in 10 times less time. And I could win just as much as I wanted to. So however greedy I wanted to be, that's how much money I could win. For Vegas cheats like Mr. D, staying anonymous is priority one. But for a team of European grifters, making a splash with their scam was part of the thrill. Casinos spar with scam artists on gaming floors around the globe. In London's Piccadilly Theatre District, the glamorous Ritz Hotel and Casino was the site of another legendary heist. happened at the roulette table. Alexis Conran, host of BBC's The Real Hustle, explains why cheating at roulette is such an attractive prospect. 
Roulette's always been a very, very attractive game for cheaters because you can win and win big. In English Roulette, gamblers can bet on any of the wheel's 37 numbers, on sections of the wheel, on colors where the ball might land. Guess the right color and you double your money. Guess the precise number where the ball lands and it's a 35 to one payout. The Ritz Three, as they came to be known, were a team of two Serbian men and one Hungarian woman. The cheaters came prepared to bet big, and they brought a device that would guarantee a huge night at the table. Since the device was never made public, Alexis had to rely on sources at Scotland Yard for details. Allegedly, it's a device that used laser technology that was hidden in a mobile phone or a PDA. Uh, this device was able to track the speed of the ball and the speed of the wheel and give a prediction as to where the ball would land. For a computer to make the prediction, one teammate has to position the laser device above the wheel. At least one person needs to be able to look into the tub, into the roulette wheel. You have to give that computer five bits of information in order to help it to make a prediction. That is the rotor speed, the ball speed, the exit position of the ball when it's leaving the track, the first point of contact on the moving part, the rotor, and where the ball lands. Alexis speculates the computer predicted a specific number on the wheel a few seconds after the ball was thrown. That number would be relayed wirelessly from the phone to an earpiece. 16. That information was then relayed to the rest of the team and they were able to place bets on the layout, covering the specific number and several numbers either side. Place your bets, please. On their first night, they won 100,000 pounds. 16, red, even. The next night, 1.2 million. That works out to about $2 million in two days. You go in, you make sure it works, you win some good money, you go back the next day, you try and push it a little harder. Maybe they pushed it a little bit too hard. The Ritz Casino reviewed surveillance footage but didn't spot the laser device. Still, they were sure something was wrong, so they called on Scotland Yard to detain the three grifters and hold them for questioning. To date, details about this scam have never been made public for obvious reasons. Now, the reason we're not gonna know exactly what they've done is because it's in no one's interest for that to be public knowledge. Scammers don't want people to know what they're doing. Uh, casinos don't want people to know what scammers are doing to them. Since England had no law against using computers in a UK casino, and because it didn't physically interfere with the game, the cheats were eventually freed and allowed to keep the money. This way of cheating is everybody's dream. It's knowing an outcome before it happens. It's, it's being able to guess the lottery numbers before they're drawn. To make sure the same scam didn't happen to them, Nevada casinos lobbied to make using any electronic cheating device a felony, punishable by a $10,000 fine and up to six years in jail. But even in the States, you have to catch the cheat before you can prosecute. A well-trained surveillance team is the casino's first line of defense. Here at the Aria Casino, thousands of gamblers crowd the gaming floor on a busy night. Spotting the thief requires a trained eye. In casino surveillance, it's important to have a lot of different backgrounds. What we have to have is guys who know craps, people who know uh, roulette. The only way to do that is to have that experience out here in the pit. A surveillance veteran, Ted Whiting was never satisfied with the older camera systems. Video feeds were often in black and white with poor image quality. So even if a thief was captured on tape, defense attorneys could argue the identification wasn't conclusive. Inconclusive, that was the first word I'd learned 16 years ago when I started in surveillance. The guy who's training me said, here's the most important thing you're gonna learn, inconclusive. I hated that term because I don't ever want it to be inconclusive. I always want to bring every issue to resolution. 
So when Ted was named surveillance director of the ARIA, he brought in the best equipment and introduced a new camera, the 360. The camera provides operators a 360 degree field of view capable of spotting and tracking a cheat across the gaming floor from one vantage point. If a cheat is caught in the act, the 360 camera can track his movements anywhere in the casino before he exits. Eventually, the cheat will have to pass through a choke point or narrow pathway in the casino. And that's where they can be nailed. So if I catch you, we find out that you stole some money maybe in the poker room. We find out about it hours after the event occurs. We follow you out of there on a 360. At some point, you pass my choke point camera, and then I have a perfect picture of your face. Recently, Ted was able to use his arsenal of cameras to track an ATM thief. It started when a woman accidentally left her ATM card in the machine after a withdrawal. She reported it to security, and surveillance determined the time of the theft using the ATM camera feed. The 360 camera tracked a suspect across the floor, and within seconds, they ID'd their man. He was followed through the aria until he reached a choke point at the exit. Ted now had an image of the thief's face, which he posted electronically to all MGM properties. The thief was caught the same day. He was actually playing at a sister property. He was sitting at Bellagio, where we, they alerted their security department that this theft occurred at Aria, and he was picked up while he was sitting there. Uh, video coverage is, is it. Without the coverage, all you have is, I said you did it. So video coverage, we're never wrong, because we, we don't have to be. The picture is worth a 1,000 words, and an HD video is worth maybe 3,000. Enter any casino on the Vegas Strip, and you'll always find plenty of action at the blackjack tables. That's because the rules of the game are relatively simple. Add face cards and number cards together to beat the dealer without going over 21. Your chance of winning the hand is 4 in 10, so the house always has the edge. But casino blackjack has a weakness, and gamblers have always tried to exploit it. The weakness, a finite number of cards in play. The way to exploit that, count every card that's dealt. My name is Josh Axelrad, and I used to be a professional card counter. Over the course of about five years of playing blackjack for a living, I took about $700,000 off the tables. When I first heard that there was this thing that you could do in a casino to genuinely win, my first thought was, that's what they're for. That's why they built Las Vegas, but this one thing. And it, it, it was like being handed the key to this entire city. Josh Axelrad served as the controller of a card counting team. By using some very basic math, he could calculate the ideal time to bet big, counting the 312 cards in the six deck shoe. Blackjack is beatable because of a coincidence, sort of intrinsic to the math of the game. You're trying to identify situations where those cards that you like, the player favorable cards, generally the tens and face cards and aces, are greatly concentrated. And you do that by keeping what we call the running count, a running tally. The running count comes from adding and subtracting values for each card dealt from the shoe. Low number cards, deuces through sixes, are plus one. Face cards, tens and aces, are minus one. Seven through nine cards are neutral. The higher the count goes, the more face cards are left in the shoe, giving the advantage to the player, not the dealer. And when you get a big positive number, when your tally is a big fat plus number of some kind, it means that you've seen far too few of the good cards so far in the, in the game. And what that means is that the remaining deck is unusually rich in those cards. So that's when you start raising your bet. To keep a low profile, Josh relied on a big money teammate to make the large wagers. When Josh knew the count was in his favor, he put his drink in his left hand. That was the signal for the big player, or BP, to enter the game. Josh gave him the count by using his chips. 
we would use chip signals to indicate how many of those units the BP was supposed to bet on each of two spots. And if we're using two different color chips, the higher denomination chip counts as five units, the smaller counts as one. Nice bets, everybody. The count determined the size of the bets. When one of the BPs comes into a shoe, he's typically gonna be betting between two hands of 500 all the way up to two hands of 10 grand. And if the BP got hot, the team's take could be in the six figures. On a great night, conceivably, we could win a couple hundred thousand dollars. That's a very good night. Casinos are the, I think, the epitome of the dark side of the market economy. It makes it all the sweeter to be in this role of turning the tables on them and putting them in the position of being a sucker that they're so accustomed to putting other people in. That's part of what makes it really, really sweet. This can get better. Yes. 21. Black guy. As counting teams became more of a problem for casinos, floor men and pit bosses watched the games more closely. Card counters call it heat. 10, 15. Heat is any kind of resistance from the casino. And card counters experience a, a lot. When you first go into the casino in this capacity, you tend to be a bit paranoid. And every time somebody from the pit comes and does anything, including perfectly normal things that are just like accounting and normal parts of their job, you seize up and you get tense. Over time, I became hot. It became more difficult for me to play. Josh finally had to resort to disguises if he wanted some action. I didn't know if casinos would even accept bets from somebody who seemed this dysfunctional. So I would go for loud, big, obnoxious, leather pants, big flamboyant wigs, sometimes female wigs that I wore, either acknowledging that they were wigs or just pretending to be some sort of metalhead, like long hair, bandanas around the way, like big sort of, big getups. I always felt pretty electrified in an anxiety-ridden sort of sense uh, whenever I was on the gaming floor. Because no matter what you're doing, things will go wrong. In fact, the way a session is expected to end is that you will be surrounded by security guards. So you're always driving down a dead-end street, and you know that. So hold up a second there, Preston. We're gonna push this bet back here for Josh. Josh and I are gonna go talk into slots. I was one of the guys who, who used to uh, identify and escort Josh out of the property if he came in and played. Uh, Josh was very aggressive, as that group tended to be. They were very aggressive, and if they found an edge, they were going after it. And that's the right way to play. Uh, we're going to catch you eventually. You might as well make some money while you're doing it. I consider them an opponent. They're somebody I have to counter. I have to know what they're doing. In order to defeat your enemy, you must become your enemy. So I learned what they know. With a surge in blackjack card counters over the past decades, casinos have started sharing information with each other. After a team hit one Vegas casino, word traveled quickly up and down the strip. The counters got the message they weren't wanted. And since the casinos are privately owned, teams could be removed from the tables at any time. They are very good at their craft. They work very hard to gain that advantage. And, and they're coming at you in a completely legal fashion. They are not doing anything wrong. We don't like it, but that doesn't make it illegal, does it? Josh Axelrad thinks the casinos are still vulnerable to card counters who are willing to be aggressive. It's a beautiful thing, and I do think it's beautiful, and I encourage you to go beat the casino, but I encourage you to do it for real. Meaning, understand that when you go in there, you're not there recreationally. You're there to do business. Blackjack, blackjack. I recommend aggression. I recommend trying to get thrown out. The best stories are always about the time you got thrown out anyway, so like, why d around? Go do it. With all the con games and scams going on at U.S. casinos, an anti-cheating industry has sprung into existence. 
Casinos spend millions each year upgrading their surveillance technology. Here at the annual World Game Protection Conference in Las Vegas, Jim Hartley works the room searching for the latest cool tool to counter the cheats. And like everything else in Vegas, it's all about the money. When they asked Willie Sutton why he robbed banks, because that's where the money is, right? So why do we have to have this level of sophistication? Because that's where the money is. And that's what we deal in. It's our currency. It's money in and out. It's not only the guys coming in from outside, it's also the personnel we work with. So every cashier, every dealer, everybody is dealing with money all the time. Cameras don't catch, recorders don't catch criminals. People do. The technology can never remove the human element. We watch people. That's what we're doing. We're people watchers at the end of the day. So if you're out there stealing every day, that increases the chances of me seeing you and figuring out what you're doing, especially if you're winning. And if you're winning consistently, I'm going to be looking for consistent winners on the games because that tells me something's wrong. So if you've never lost on blackjack, I'm going to be watching you pretty heavy, right? I mean, it, it just makes sense. With professional cheaters, card counters, and con men stealing millions every year, casinos can never let down their guard. It's a continuous cat and mouse game. They're going to do one thing to us. We have to now build our machines differently to stop them. The Borgata in Atlantic City is the top grossing casino in New Jersey raking in up to $700 million a year. For Borgata Director of Surveillance, Greg Schaff, preventing casino theft means always staying one step ahead of the cheats. We're dealing with the human element. There's people everywhere around the country and around the world trying to figure out ways to rip us off. So it's, it's our challenge to make sure that we evaluate everything that we have and throw our systems and information to concentrate on the correct areas to find out where criminal activity could be occurring. Greg recently introduced a remarkable new software system to the Borgata surveillance operation. If you look here, we have... Kaimi software combines casino databases, including hotel check-ins, players' gambling history, even employee records. Casino consultant Bruce Ban uses Kaimi to create a digital player profile that helps to identify a potential thief. It has algorithms built in that will tell you if somebody's betting out of their normal pattern, whether they are winning more than they, they normally should uh, statistically. It also allows you to uh, match addresses, phone numbers uh, between employees and uh, patrons. By having the ability to marry all these together and, and to do the analytical work through the system, it gives us a great opportunity as it sends alerts when they see an area that's vulnerable. Today, Greg's surveillance team spots a blackjack cheat. She just switched her bet. There she goes. She just capped her bet. That floor hasn't moved, has she? No, she's been on the game the whole time. Looks like the floor person might have signaled. Yeah, that's two. Uh, one more less. I think we're going to get security involved. Suspecting that the floor manager might be working with the cheat, Greg's surveillance team runs both women's data through the software. Uh, if you look here, we have both Phyllis Morgan, who's the patron, and Jennifer Stevens, who's the floor person, and they live together, which is a red flag right away, especially with the amount that Phyllis Morgan's been winning. won 61,700 in her total play. April 10th, all the way to current date, she has not lost one time she's played. Everything is above the win line. That is extremely unusual. There she goes. She just capped her bet. Yeah, and she, she signaled her, too. I'm, I'm going to get a security call. Floor person's on the game. Yeah, this is surveillance uh, to uh, security manager. Excuse me, I'm security. I'm going to need you to gather your chips and come with me. Did I do something wrong? We'll discuss it off the table. 
At the Borgata Casino in Atlantic City, the surveillance team has spotted two women cheating. There she goes, she just capped her bet. With the help of a computer program called Kaimi. Excuse me, some security, I'm gonna need you to gather your chips and come with me. Security pulls both women off the floor and takes them away for questioning. I need you to come with us as well, please. Is there a problem? Well, we can talk about it in the office. Um, I'm gonna need somebody to tap me out. Okay. Thank you. But it turns out this blackjack cheat was just a test for Greg Schaff's crew. A planted scam to keep his team on their toes. Okay. If you would, thank you. Greg knows the cheats will never stop trying to beat the house. Now the game is new people, new faces with kind of the same old cheating techniques, but just enhanced. Enhanced as they utilize more technology, they utilize better devices. So we need to have something to help us combat this problem. Somebody who's coming here to Cheap Borgata, I would say, like, give your best shot. I feel that we are prepared ourselves, our staff, that we are able to at least put up a good fight. And they'll need to put up a good fight. Because in gambling meccas like Las Vegas, the con men and scammers never sleep. But for slot cheat Mr. D, Stealing eventually became a job, just a way to pay the bills. I never drive the strip just for fun. If I come up here on the strip, it's because I'm working. I refer to this as, as work because it is a job. You know, when you first do it, it's, you're thrilled to death. You can't believe it. You think uh, you can just laugh at Lady Luck anymore. You, you don't have to depend on that, but it becomes a job. Very excited at first, and, you, and your blood's rushing, and you think you're smarter than anybody else. But after uh, you do this uh, for years like I have, it's going to work. It's putting on a, on a suit and going to work. And that's what it becomes. When I'm not working, I don't come anywhere near this. Nowhere near it. I made up my mind a long time ago, this is what I do, and, and I'm comfortable with that. Um, what I recommend it to someone else, you know, if they, if that's what they want to do and they have the wherewithal in the practice, uh, then I'd say, yeah, go ahead, you know, uh, keep alert. And then you might, you might get arrested, you might go to jail, but that's all part of this game. And after 30 years, the game finally caught up to Mr. D. Casino surveillance recorded him working a property on the strip. He was busted and charged with 26 counts of cheating and theft. Right now, I'm facing uh, one to six years. I'm sweating blood. I don't want him to go do it. I mean, I'll do it, you know. Do I have it coming? Yeah, I probably do. You know, but I don't want to go do it. Of all the money that I made doing this through the years, the few million that I've made, you know what I got left? Zero. Because now you got to deal with attorneys, fines, restitution, all that stuff. They take all your money. Don't worry. Uh, if I had to do it all over again, I'd be an attorney. Because they're the ones who make all the money. If you want to do this, make some money, have a good time, and then go to jail, well, then I recommend it. If I had to do it all over again, I would give all the money back that I stole to keep from going to jail. Two days after our interview, Mr. D received a prison sentence of one to five years. He'll be eligible for parole after 12 months. As the casinos fight to keep cheats like Mr. D off the gaming floors, surveillance pros like Ted Whiting and Jim Hartley maintain a healthy respect for their opposition. People are always going to try to cheat the casino. There's always going to be a dishonest person somewhere who thinks they can outsmart us. But eventually, we catch up to it. We exist because the cheats exist. If they didn't come in and try to beat us, they wouldn't need us. But they're always, always going to try that, so I'm always going to have a job. I guess I need to thank the cheats for pushing that technology and allowing me to be able to do this, because it has been quite a lot of fun. My message to the guy who's trying to beat the casino would be, please, come on down. <laughs> we need our jobs. We need to keep working. We'll teach us something new. Casino and cheat, cat and mouse, move and counter move. The outcome changes every day. Someone wins, someone loses. And sometimes, 
The best either side can hope for is a draw.